Good morning. My name is Johan Vargas Calixto. I'm a PhD candidate at McGill University. And today I want to talk about also considering the timing of certain fetal heart rate features for its evaluation during labor. As my colleagues have described previously, the main, one of the main research of our studies are to, sorry, one of the main objectives of our research is to use cardiotocography along with machine learning to be able to predict when a fetus is progressing towards a normal outcome of labor or when they are progressing towards HIE. Commonly, CTG would be assessed based on certain patterns such as baseline accelerations, decelerations, and contractions in the uterine pressure. And from these patterns, certain features or information is extracted to evaluate how, uh, compared to certain ranges, the fetus is at risk or not. So one of these patterns is, for instance, in the baseline, um, to get the baseline level, which is the mean value of the fetal heart rate in this uh, segment. If we look at that as a function of the time before delivery, um, we can see that there's some evolution in how the baseline level uh, changes during the last six hours of labor. Now in machine learning, what would commonly be done is to look at the last hour of labor, uh, have an algorithm learn this distribution to then expect it to be used prospectively and tell when a fetus is progressing towards HIE or acidosis. But if we see how this distribution is changing, um, this at the end of labor is quite different from six hours before delivery. So only focusing on this um, in, on this segment of the distribution is disregarding all this evolution, and it would actually uh, prevent the classifier from identifying early deviations from normality that might be useful to um, and to inform early interventions. So I'm going to show some of the results that I got in this um, in these terms, but first I'm just going to introduce super fast what is the normalized mutual information, in case you're not familiar with that. It's a measure of uh, association between two variables. So it's like Pearson's correlation, but also measures nonlinear association. And it's used in machine learning studies to assess predictor importance. So if there's high association, we can say this predictor is um, very important for classification, like in this case. This is a variable where we get it, we get a distribution for group one in blue and group two in orange. And because there's a perfect association of 100%, this is a very separable um, problem. However, when there's some overlap, we're going to have a reduced level of information, uh, which in this case was 14%. But this is just looking at the variable from one angle. What happens when the variable is evolving with respect to another variable? If we were to plot this particular, um, again, these are synthetic variables, if we were to plot this particular variable with respect to time, we would see that maybe this variable was separable given a time-barring decision rule. And in this case, the level of information is increased. So I did that, or I analyzed this with fetal heart rate features. But the level of information that the fetal heart rate features provide on the outcome of labor is never as high. Otherwise, this problem would have been solved a long time ago. So let me show you the level of information that a series of features provided on the outcome of labor independently. So these are 83 features that are, um, have been proposed in the literature, and all of them are in the x-axis. And in the y-axis, I'm showing the individual information that they provide on the outcome of labor. This is based on a stationary analysis, so no time is considered. When I included the time before delivery for, to give context to these features, the level of information that they provided double or triple, which means that using the time to delivery, increase the level of information that the features provided in the outcome of labor, which might translate into enhanced discriminability. Unfortunately, the time before delivery is not possible to be used prospectively. To, to know it, we need to know the time of birth, we, which we only know after that happens. So to continue on this, uh, on this line, I um, evaluated um, an alternative time index, which was the time from labor onset. And 
the idea behind this is that, well, clinicians do not treat uh, or do not assess the same way a fetus that has been two hours in labor than one that has been 24 hours in labor because I wanted to use a variable that could also quantify how long the fetus had endured the stress of labor. And when I replace the time before delivery by the time from labor onset in this, um, in this univariate analysis, what I found was that the level of information was increased even further, which means that this is an excellent choice for time indexing and to develop time barring classifiers. And if you're wondering which are the top performer uh, features, you may be familiar with some of them because they are also the focus of clinical um, assessment like baseline level, deceleration area, or the slope of the baseline. So this gave me, this is telling me that time from labor onset is a good indexing variable for uh, classification studies. So I wanted to test this, and I compared two classifiers. One that was trained only on cardiotocography data, and another one that also included an additional feature for classification, which was the time from labor onset. This was a binary classifier between healthy and unhealthy cases. And as, my, uh, as Ethan showed before, uh, the way that I set up this classifier was to, uh, in new cases, it would generate consecutive predictions, simulating real-time monitoring, to see how many cases were um, being identified as labor progressed. So I'm going to show you now the cumulative number of predictions that I got on each of the healthy and HIE groups, starting with the HIE group. And what I'm showing here in red is the time-dependent detection rate, so using, all, using time from labor onset. And in blue is the time-independent um, detection rate, so without time from labor onset. And in black, this line here is the um, observed emergency cesarean rate in the HIA group, which was about 44%. So these were the, the infants that were identified by clinicians and got a C-section rate. And if this is our goal, if we wanted to get a classifier that identified as many cases, we can see that the time-dependent classifier matched this number at about three hours before delivery which when compared to the time independent classifier was one hour earlier. And if we're just interested in how many more detections we got, we can see that at one hour before delivery, the time dependent classifier increased the number of detections by 11.2%. And as Ethan described earlier, the restriction on these classifiers were, was to not generate more detections in the healthy group than, um, than those that had an emergency C-section and neither of those classifiers surpass the, the level of emergency C-section rates in this group. So just to conclude, um, including the time from labor onset in classification is beneficial. It increases the level of detection by three to five percent, and it also helped to issue earlier detections because we were able to match the uh, C-section rate three hours before delivery. Now this is a first attempt to include time into classification, other alternatives to explore would be to have a classifier with time barring parameters or a series or a cascade of classifiers that are uh, particular to certain periods of labor, and, but that's still to be tested. So I'm just going to finish with the funding acknowledgement. Thank you. Thanks.